How did America conquer the world and fail its own people? Check this out, leave your comments, ding the bell, share it with your friends, and subscribe to our channel. On the line with us is uh, Professor Jared Yates Sexton, a writer and political analyst. He has a new book out, it's called American Rule, How a Nation Conquered the World But Failed Its People. Uh, the website, jysexton.com, and also that's the Twitter handle. Uh, Professor Jared Yates Sexton, welcome to the program. Tell us about, tell us about American Rule. How, how did we conquer the world and fail our own people? Well, first of all, thanks for having me. Um, I, I would say that what, what we've seen with America, uh, particularly in the 20th century, is we saw this idea that the United States was on some sort of ordained mission, that somehow or another we were the, the heroes of history and, you know, godly saviors of democracy. But in truth, that idea was a really well-constructed and purposeful illusion and propaganda technique that hid a lot of really ugly behaviors and control mechanisms that made sure that there was systemic inequality and uh, kept common people and regular people from troubling the power structure that was uh, both wealthy and influential in nature. I'm assuming in your analysis this ha there has been an ebb and flow to this throughout the 240-year history of this country? Well, it began uh, with a really intentional construction. Uh, the Constitution and the, the framers were specifically focused on making sure that America was in the hands of the wealthy and powerful few. If you actually go back and, and look at the notes from James Madison, what you find is that the framers uh, were really distrustful of common people to the point that Benjamin Franklin had to remind them that uh, they had helped fight the revolution. Uh, so from the beginning, of course, we have that uh, aristocratic control and white supremacy in our laws. And it's really only strengthened over time. We've had a couple of moments where the mythology has been troubled, of course, most famously with the Civil War in the 19th century. But now we face, with Donald Trump and the rise of Trumpism, uh, we, we face another test of that mythology and a moment where it's starting to flicker a little bit, and, and that makes it inherently dangerous. You know, other nations around the world uh, took uh, what you're describing as the American mythology and... Uh, implemented it in ways that seem to work much better for their people. Uh, I'm thinking, for example, of the Scandinavian countries, but not exclusively. Um, I, you know, I think we just saw this uh, in, in Bolivia this week, or last week. Um, what, what lessons can we learn from people who, tr who learned their lessons from us? Well, one of the problems with uh, the, the American experiment is that from the very beginning, it's been touched off with this idea of divinity. Um, you know, on, on the American right, and this, of course, took hold during the Reagan years, there's this idea that America was a shining city on the hill that was chosen by God to carry out his will. The problem is when you start viewing it through a political and civic religious lens, all, the, all of a sudden, the country becomes unimpeachable. It becomes unquestionable. And to even criticize or even talk about the possibility of improving the nation is tantamount to heresy. The problem is that much of American history and politics has been taken over by this religious view of America, which makes it nearly impossible to really question the structure or to even try and reform it. So what's your suggested solution? Well, I think first and foremost that we have to look back on our history and understand the truth in it. I mean, I think there's a reason why Donald Trump is spending a lot of time on the campaign trail talking about patriotic education and making sure that the founding fathers are treated almost as if they're saints and America has been good from its very beginning. I think once we start troubling these mythologies and we start dealing with where we've come from, we can understand where we are, why particularly we are you know, drowning in conspiracy theories and these anti-democratic movements. And I think that once we understand our past, we can start to chart a future that is actually more real, more human, and uh, better for everybody involved. Do you, do you see any models for uh, moving America forward in the direction of... Well, first of all, uh, d I'm assuming that you see some value in the mythology itself. In other words, if it was real, it would have been good. Um, and if that's the case, are there examples around the world that we could emulate or lessons that we could learn to actually 
fulfill that that uh, mythology or that promise or that uh, ideal? Well, I think one of the main problems is that there's a massive division between the rhetoric and the idea of like the Declaration of Independence, which, of course, is based on inalienable rights and liberty and freedom and equality and the Constitution. No, I'm asking you about today. Oh, for sure. I think that we can look at the possibility that because America has fallen under these spells, that it's led to movements like Trumpism. And I think that we need to take a look at how we've been misled and and look at other countries that have sort of risen in power, such as Great Britain, of course, which during the the British Empire was you know the, the biggest empire and the biggest influence over the world, and eventually they moved away from trying to control other countries through colonialism or military matters, and they started turning more in on themselves, talking about things like healthcare and protections for workers and individuals. So I think there is a way out of this problem, but I think it starts with taking a look at our history and where that mythology has fallen short. So at the end of World War II, with the collapse of the Ottoman Empire and the, and the really consequential beginning of the collapse of the, of the British Empire, and then, you know, to the, to the full collapse of it, uh, maybe the collapse isn't the right word, but, you know, pulling out of uh, African countries that they had occupied and whatnot and, and changing the nature of their relationship with, you know, dependent states like Canada and Australia in the 1950s and 60s. Um, you know, Britain basically said, OK, that empire thing, that was, you know, it was a good run for 100 years but or longer, but we're not going to do that anymore. We're just going to become a country that takes care of ourselves and our people, but will also be a good neighbor to everybody else. Is that the sort of thing that you're suggesting for the United States? I think that that is probably one of the best ways forward. I think particularly at the beginning of the 21st century, with things like the Iraq War and the so-called War on Terrorism, we found ourselves in more and more countries, dozens of countries running military operations, undercover operations with our bases everywhere. And the military industrial complex, of course, focused on maintaining American hegemony and, you know, dominance of interest. I think when we take a look at like what you were talking about with the British Empire, starting to realize that they could become part of an international alliance, they could work with their neighbors and not necessarily have to control other populations. I think that's a really exemplary example. I, I, I think that's a pretty good idea of what we probably need to look at. So we're in over 700 countries. We have over 700 military, there's not 700 countries, but we have over 700 military bases outside the United States around the world. Um, where do we begin? I mean, how, how, is there a framework for deconstructing empire? Are there lessons to be learned from the British experience? Well, I, I think in terms of deconstructing empire, one of the things that we have to take a look at is where we put our resources and where we put our energy. I think like a lot of people, I think that we need to take it away from projecting our power abroad and bring it home. I mean, there's absolutely no reason why human projects in America aren't pursued, why we don't have health care, why our infrastructure is crumbling. I mean, with the pandemic and, of course, with economic crisis and hurricanes and, and, and you know, wildfires out west, we see that we are increasingly unable to meet these moments. And I think if we stop projecting that power and trying to control people outside of ourselves, which inevitably always blows back in our face and, and leads to unintended consequences, if we start bringing the resources home and the focus home and trust that the world will not go haywire simply because we're not controlling it, I think that Americans and actually people abroad as well could live better, uh, better longer lives. Yeah, look at the history of Iraq, of Iran, of Vietnam. <laughs> it just goes on and on and on. <laughs> Professor Jared Yates Sexton, the new book is American Rule, How a Nation Conquered the World but Failed Its People. 